The Casey Anthony docuseries just recently premiered on the Peacock streaming platform, and for the first time on television, Casey Anthony shares her version of events. Events that include new allegations that place the full blame of Kaylee's demise on her father, George Anthony. Today, I will carefully analyze each element of her claims in her three-part series, leaving you with a clear and unobstructed view of this case. And at the end of this video, I will present evidence that predicted what she would say in this docuseries six years ago. Director Alexandra Dean takes a primary role throughout the entire three-part series, carefully providing participants with information seemingly intended to sway their opinions while encouraging the same view shift from the audience. But even the most generous and objective view of this series would leave one to believe that it was created as a clear attempt at giving Casey Anthony the public life she clearly wants, based entirely on a salacious news story that was never presented at trial. The series sets out to explain Casey Anthony's behavior, including everything she ever said, everything she ever did, the lies she told, all of the time she wasted, including every minute she spent not looking for Kaylee, and seems to all but state that her actions were in no way her fault. Throughout the series, we are shown a litany of reasons why Casey bears no responsibility, but in fact, the entirety of the blame should be placed on her father, George Anthony, the same man who she now claims was the perpetrator of the crimes that she was charged with. In this episode, we will review each of Casey's new allegations, contrasting it against the evidence presented before and after trial, and review any new information provided in her series. Finally, I will present the facts as we know them, discuss my view of those facts, and then leave it to you to decide the truth. This is Through the Looking Glass, The Casey Anthony Story, Episode 3. Now before we begin, I want to issue some important disclaimers. Due to the nature of the content discussed in Casey's documentary, I want to issue a trigger warning for harm against children and inappropriate sexual harm. Viewer discretion is advised. I had originally intended to add various video clips from her documentary in this episode, but recently several creators on YouTube have already had their videos taken down by NBC. So I'm going to have to give my analysis without using video from the series, which will also help avoid any more money getting into Casey's hands. And concerning how much money she got paid is something we're about to talk about in detail. Now, normally I would approach this analysis as I would any other case that I've discussed to date, but this series is very different and I need to present the foundation for how I will approach discussing her claims throughout the entirety of this video. One. I do not claim to know what did or did not happen to Casey Anthony, specific to her claim involving childhood trauma from her father. As a victim of childhood trauma myself, I am intimately aware of the pain and agony that it causes. I have spent many years of my life going through counseling and then eventually helping others who have also suffered similar experiences. No one deserves to go through that kind of pain, and it is not my place to contest her allegations. Therefore, I will not be addressing whether or not I believe she's telling the truth about that singular issue within this documentary. I will, however, discuss everything else and why I personally believe that there are clear indications of deception throughout the entirety of this series. Two. As a victim of childhood trauma, in my years of counseling, I have learned that those experiences do not in any way give me or anyone an excuse for committing crimes, allowing crimes to happen to loved ones that we are legally responsible for, and in no way excuses the failure to protect those loved ones from physical harm. And three. I have stated in my last video that the foundation for how I approach discussing true crime is from a standpoint of personal responsibility. Through my years of counseling, I have learned the importance of taking responsibility for my own behavior. Empathy, understanding, and a positive support system was critical to my healing process, 
but I also learned that perpetually blaming my trauma for my decisions would only prevent me from having a healthy and productive life. It certainly doesn't mean that empathy and understanding is absent. On the contrary, it simply just doesn't give me or anyone an excuse for failing to do the right thing in our own lives. And it is with that lens that I will discuss and evaluate this series. Let's begin. The documentary opens with a somber and pensive piano soundtrack that will be played throughout the entire nearly four hour series. The melancholic background music seems like an intentional foreshadowing meant to set the emotional stage for what's to come. Casey Anthony walks into frame, seen through the glass panels of the front door inside the rented house that will serve as the backdrop for her new and upcoming revelations. Cameras follow her into her room as we are quickly shown the first of many moments clearly meant to humanize a person that still draws the ire of untold millions. Watching her unpack her bags, taking out familiar pictures of Kaylee, I had to remind myself to remain as objective as humanly possible, if for no other reason than to afford her the opportunity to state her case. But being fully transparent, that would become increasingly difficult as time went on. The first few minutes of the series provides us with a familiar montage of the media that surrounded the Casey Anthony saga, including a quote from the indelible Barbara Walters. She calls the Casey Anthony trial the most famous murder case since O.J. Simpson. After hearing those words, I couldn't help but imagine the response from the general public if O.J. Simpson had created a three-part documentary, effectively passing the blame to someone else entirely. But what if O.J. Simpson had gone on national television and made similar claims while simultaneously rejecting any notion of his own responsibility? I try to fathom the impact of something that insensitive and subjective and the impact that it would have on the family of Nicole Simpson and Ron Goldman. In fact, O.J. did attempt to do a version of that and was run off television and then run out of town. But a lot has changed in the years following his not guilty verdict and that is best shown in the very existence of this docuseries. And one of the questions I have been routinely asked since starting the series was how much money Casey Anthony stood to make from NBC, the makers of this documentary. Now, while no clear data has been released concerning how much she was paid, here is what we do know. Casey Anthony filed for bankruptcy in 2013, resulting in her owing over $750,000. Most of that money was owed to her former attorney, Jose Baez, and the Orange County Sheriff's Department for all the time they wasted running down her lies. But just two years prior, in December of 2011, we learned that Casey had teamed up with Scott Sternberg, a producer who was actively looking to sell her story for $750,000. And she attached this hefty price tag just months after her trial, but unfortunately, no one wanted to buy it. So years later, when Casey entered into bankruptcy proceedings, the trustee overseeing her case rightfully saw her story as an asset, which he valued at approximately $25,000, largely due to the fact that at the time, no one was willing to pay more than $10,000 for it. So what did Casey do? It was reported that she took a loan from a friend for the value of her story, twenty-five dollars gave the money to the bankruptcy trustee so that she could retain the rights to her story and wait for a time that it would become more valuable. And when you view the value of her story as a transaction, it's hard to ignore the heavily biased nature of this entire series. But I want to reiterate, we don't know what she was paid. However, as someone who has worked in television production in recent years, I cannot recall a time where I have seen a participant of a show listed on the call sheet that wasn't paid for their time. And knowing that, for me, is hard to ignore when watching this series. But let's continue. After a few short introductions to some of the participants of the series, we hear the voice of Alexandra Dean asking Casey why she's choosing to participate in the documentary since she has no creative control over the direction of what is said. Casey's meek response is that she merely wants an audience, 
but right away we are clearly intended to be given the impression that Casey will not be guiding the overall direction or control of this series. And now having viewed the documentary in its entirety, nothing about that statement seems true, and you're about to see why. Over the course of the first episode, we learn that Casey has been working for and living with Pat McKenna, the lead investigator that worked on her case during the trial. The same Pat McKenna, who strangely enough worked on the O.J. Simpson case. Since the trial, McKenna has played the role of a surrogate father to Casey, allowing her to live with him, employing her, and helping to keep her safe from the outside world. Shortly after being informally introduced to the litany of people who will speak in defense of Casey Anthony, we are reintroduced to Detective John Allen. Detective Allen is a corpulent, balding, aging Caucasian male who will serve as one of the only voices in opposition to Casey's claims throughout the entirety of this documentary. And it's hard for me to believe that this wasn't an intentional move on the part of director Alexandra Dean for a host of obvious reasons. But despite the role he plays in the series, I have always viewed Detective Allen as an ardent defender of justice for the one person who matters most in this case, Kaylee Anthony. Detective Allen reintroduces the case that was brought against Casey Anthony, reintroducing the viewers to the turbulent history of what so many of us watched in real time. We are again reminded of the lies Casey told from the onset, and a short time later, we are shown the familiar conversation between Casey and her mother shortly after her arrest. But this familiar audio is reframed from that of a loving mother trying to state the truth to that of a cruel parent refusing to believe her own child. Even as Detective Allen is invited to listen to that call, he is almost apologetic in his reaffirmation of Casey's guilt, what so many of us clearly heard in episode one and two of this series. A short time later, we learn that Casey's infamous Bella Vita tattoo, which stood for the good life, was, in her words, a big F you to her parents. And I contend that's what this entire series is as well. Halfway through the first episode, Casey boldly declares that she is a convicted liar. But almost immediately after that, it seems like her entire statement is thrown on its head and we are asked to call into question everything we think we know. The director then asks Casey if she's truthful today, and she responds by saying that she's a little too honest, that she's blunt and direct, almost painfully so. We are then given glowing reviews of Casey Anthony from her elderly life partner, Pat McKenna, which unsurprisingly includes extolling Casey's truthfulness, her exceptional ability to do his accounting. He goes on to say that his job is to catch people in lies and that she's only ever been truthful. And now, after watching this series in its entirety, it really does feel like I was being gaslit from the moment this series began, most especially by Pat McKenna. But I suppose someone who is willing to defend O.J. Simpson doesn't have the most accurate compass when it comes to people. Now, eventually, we are introduced to Annie Downing Goderwiss, who is, interestingly enough, listed as Casey Anthony's former best friend. Now, the director tells Annie that Casey was described by law enforcement as someone who just wanted a party and was ready to end the life of her child. To which, of course, Annie immediately denies that Casey could have possibly wanted that and that she was always an exceptional mother, which struck me as incredibly odd, because if that was the case, then why didn't she testify at Casey's trial? If Casey was in fact such a great mother and never showed any signs of wanting distance from her own child, then why wouldn't Casey's attorney subpoena her former best friend and have her testify the way she is in this documentary? Really think about this for a second. Casey was facing death row. Wouldn't you want an important character witness testifying for you in a trial that involves whether or not you live or die? But allow me to shed light on the legal side of that process. If there was a credible character witness for Casey Anthony that was known before the trial, she would have been subpoenaed to testify in court. Now, Annie eventually goes on to explain that Casey lied all the time, that it was a chronic issue that Casey faced through the entirety of knowing her, 
and they are no longer close friends. But what she says is that when she knew Casey, she lied about everything. But I have a question that I just can't help but ask right now. Why is this any different? Because people who were hired to save her from death row claim that she's all better now? And I have a very compelling reason for asking that question. Because before I finish my analysis of this series, I will provide you with a documented history of allegations against Casey making up fantastical claims and lies, including the one she's telling in this docu-series. And in this legal document, it states that she fabricates stories just like this one as a vendetta against people who have wronged her, simply to get revenge. And throughout her own documentary, you can see clear signs of her fury against the people who have dared to cross her. Now, after Annie's effusively positive comments about Casey, she helps her old friend by telling the audience that each time Casey was lying, that it was always attached to kernels of the truth. She wants us to believe that every single time she lies, that somewhere hidden in there is also some element of fact. Okay, let's go with that. So then where is Juliette Lewis? Because it's been proven she never existed. Or maybe Casey expects us to believe that she was friends with the celebrity Juliette Lewis. Or how about Zanny the Nanny? Because even years after the trial, in a deposition, Casey was still claiming that Zanida was real and that she was her babysitter. But now in this documentary, she finally admits that she never existed. It is my contention that Casey only tells stories that she knows that we cannot verify one way or another. Until, of course, some element of her story is disproven. And then she goes looking for another set of lies. Because that is exactly what she did in her case. And according to her own friends, it's what she's been doing her entire life. And it's my opinion, it's what she's doing right now. And the sad part is that she's exploiting a generation of young people who realize the importance of advocating for victims so that she can piggyback on the goodwill of those people, erase all the pain that she's caused, then place it on her father for whom we can do nothing to prove or disprove her claims, effectively forcing him to either sue her or stay quiet. But either way, the bell's been rung, and now because of this documentary, she enjoys the support of countless people who have watched it and hook, line, and sinker bought into every single claim that she's made, regardless of merit. But hold on tight, because she left massive holes in her story, and I'm about to pick them apart. Let's continue. A short time later, the director takes Casey to the jail where she was incarcerated for three years and asks her what she thought was happening during those 31 days that Kaylee was missing. Now, to me, this is one of the most inadvertently important parts of the entire documentary. The director asks her when Casey was with the police after her mother reports Kaylee missing, what does she believe about Kaylee's condition, specifically about where she is? Casey says, and I quote, she's okay. That's what I believed the entire time, not just with the cops. Every day I sat in jail up until the day she was found, unquote. Now, as I mentioned, I can't play the clip courtesy of NBC, but I need to impress upon you the importance of this moment. As Casey is remembering these details, she's calm, unemotional. She isn't hysterical or distressed. She doesn't appear to be reliving anything traumatic or even bothersome. And I point that out because later on, towards the end of the documentary, she begins talking about this same moment and she's nearly inconsolable. And it's just one of the many examples of what I believe is an incredible deception from a convicted liar. Casey goes on to explain away her dysfunctional behavior as being entirely related to trauma. And I want to be clear Pathological liars can be formed as a result of trauma, but sadly, many people are under the incorrect belief that most or all pathological liars are formed in this way. Cluster B personality disorders refer to a number of psychological conditions, including many that we've discussed in prior episodes, from antisocial personality disorder, as well as borderline, histrionic, and narcissistic personality disorder. 
Now, speaking broadly to these conditions, one of the commonly seen traits demonstrated by people who suffer from these disorders is pathological lying. And I myself have seen cluster B types that become masterful manipulators and go on to be some of the most proficient and talented grifters you've ever seen. But in these moments, as Casey is reflecting on the number of times she lied to people around her, she seems to have a moment of self-reflection, admitting that she made herself look crazy, that her lies fundamentally eradicated any credibility that she had with law enforcement. And for a moment, she seems genuine and even sincere. And while looking somber, she says, As far as I'm concerned, there's no justifying my actions or behavior. Now, if that had been the end of episode one and we were allowed to sit with Casey's admission of fault, her acknowledgement of her own shortcomings, I can say that I would admit that Casey had truly made some considerable personal growth in the time since her trial. But after a long delay that now feels like more manipulation from the creator of this documentary, we are introduced to Casey Anthony's thesis for this entire series. She looks at the camera and says, except to say that I was doing what I was conditioned to do. So it started and seemed like a sincere self-reflective moment ended with her rejecting any form of accountability and claiming that her actions were all the fault of her programming. Casey goes on to briefly describe the nature of her dysfunctional family growing up, including leveling claims against her father for allegedly taking money from her mother's retirement account, something she was later accused of doing by members of her own family. But I want to show you something that helps to demonstrate why I believe this entire series was a well-orchestrated plan to change the way the American public sees this case. The following morning, the director greets Casey and asks her a question. She looks at her and asks, how did you sleep? And Casey responds by saying, there's no such thing as good sleep. Not that I know. Really? There's no such thing as good sleep for you? Well, that's kind of weird because didn't you say this? I don't give a shit about what anybody thinks about me. I don't care about that. Yeah. I never will. I'm okay with myself. I sleep pretty good at night. And regardless of what you may now think about Casey Anthony, if you don't hear that and see the intentional effort by this documentary to rewrite the past and manipulate what you now believe about her, then keep watching because I'm just getting started. Immediately after her comment, we begin to see the ultimate purpose of this documentary, and that's to level claims against her father and her brother. Casey is, however, careful to let the viewers know that Kaylee wasn't the byproduct of relations with her father or brother. She then begins to show the audience important moments of her parents arguing in various interviews that they've conducted with the media, and I couldn't help but think about walking in her parents' shoes for a day. What it would be like to be the parents of someone accused of heinous crimes against your own grandchild, the conflict it would create, how every crack and problem that exists in your relationship is then put on display for the whole world to see. George and Cindy Anthony are clearly not perfect people, and no one is claiming that. But this really does seem like a glass house situation if I've ever seen one. Casey goes on to describe her behavior in the weeks following June 16, 2008. And for me, it just demonstrates her incredible lack of maturity, even all these years later. Because after claiming that her father was a thief, she then claims, I completely replicated my father's behavior during those 31 days. I watched him lie, manipulate, and take money from people, and then I did all of those things. She even goes on to say that she stole and lied to protect herself from the outside world. But we don't hear about how she's learned from her mistakes, how horrendously wrong it was to lie or steal, how sorry she is. No discussion about the fact that she was 22 years old at the time and perfectly capable of knowing the difference between right and wrong. Nope, it's all her father's fault. And how dare anyone say otherwise? <laughs> you know, I would absolutely love to hear her make that statement in front of a judge just to get a judge's reaction to it. Can you imagine blaming all of your criminal actions 
on your father and acting as though that that is somehow an acceptable excuse? Casey goes on to say that she lied, but no one asked why. And that has to be one of the most insanely idiotic and stupid things she could have possibly said in this entire documentary. Because everyone asked why. And she's had over a decade to prepare an answer. And rest assured, by the time I'm done with this video, you'll understand exactly why I am more certain of her guilt than I was prior to watching this series. But here's just one more example of why I'm convinced. The director asks her, why were you lying to the cops? And without skipping a beat, Casey says, I was doing what I was told. By, of all people, her father. So, so let me get this right, Casey. You expect us to believe that your father told you to make up the lies that you told? George Anthony told you to concoct a ridiculous story about Zanny the Nanny? And then right after that, he told you to fabricate a story about Juliette Lewis and having a job as an event coordinator at Universal Studios, a job that you never actually had, as well as every other lie you told to the police. Casey expects us to believe and buy that all of those lies were encouraged and directed by her father, George Anthony. And if you believe that, then I think I'm ready to sell my oceanfront property in Arizona and then auction off my unicorn right after I sell my $10 million Lamborghini previously owned by Elon Musk. Because if anyone actually believes that her father told her to say those lies, please get in touch with me. I'll give you a great deal. Because in a day where the likes of FTX fraudster Sam Bankman-Fried is being given a pass by some of his own investors for having made some minor accounting errors, it looks like I'm about to get filthy rich. But I digress. By the second episode, Casey begins to recount the story of what happened on the day that she says Kaylee went missing. And remember, this is the very first time anyone has ever heard this story, and we are hearing it 14 years after the fact. Casey starts off by telling us that she was a light sleeper, that Kaylee was asleep next to her and that she thought the door was locked. The next thing she knows, she's awoken from a deep sleep to her father shaking her awake, asking her where Kaylee is. In her explanation, she's very clearly inferring that she was drugged by her father because Kaylee knew not to leave the room and that she never went anywhere without her permission. Never mind the fact that people saw Kaylee running around by herself without her mother on more than one occasion, but those details don't fit her narrative. Casey begins running around the house, looking everywhere for Kaylee, and by the time she comes around the side of the house, her father is standing there holding Kaylee, limp in his arms, and Kaylee is soaking wet. Now, according to Casey, he hands Kaylee to her, tells her it's her fault, and this loving mother collapses with her in her arms while her father blames her for all of it. And these are Casey's exact words about what happens next. She says, and I quote, She's heavy. She's cold. As I'm sitting there with her on my lap, I was hysterical, just staring at her, not knowing what to do. He takes her from me and immediately softens his tone and tells me it's going to be okay. Unquote. Listen, I'm going to go ahead and speak very candidly right now, because at this point of the documentary and for over an hour, we've been told just how much Casey Anthony loves her daughter, over and over, what a good mother she was, how much she loved and protected her. But then, Kaylee's put into her arms, cold and lifeless, and she doesn't know what to do, and goes on to tell us that she was more concerned with protecting her father? Now, I'm willing to bet that there are men and women listening to the sound of my voice right now who were harmed as children. And even if that person was accusing you of being responsible for your child being unresponsive, that you would move heaven and earth to get your child help, even if it meant that you would be blamed for it. How do I know that? Because I've worked with medical examiners in my prior career. You know, the people who get to show up to these kinds of scenes where parents lose a child to a tragic pool accident. And when they show up, they all say the same thing. Every single parent is desperately trying to do whatever they can to save their child. Even the alcoholic and drug-addicted parents, even they call the police. 
And do you know the only time that a parent doesn't call the police in their experience? It's when the parent was involved or has something to hide. No amount of trauma is an excuse for ignoring the moral and familial obligation Casey Anthony had to protect her daughter Kaylee, especially if her father was the monster she claims he is. If what she says is true, she doesn't have less of a responsibility, but more of one to ensure that her child did not fall into the same hellscape that she says that she endured. And if George Anthony did the things that she claims he did, then she not only had a maternal obligation to protect Kaylee, but a legal one. And even though far too many of us were victims of something we could not stop, now that we are adults, there is nothing on the face of the earth that would keep me from protecting my children from that same pain, most especially from the person who caused it. And that's what Casey Anthony doesn't seem to understand. Her story doesn't make sense. And no amount of tears, 14 years too late, will ever change that. A short time later, the documentary transitions and we begin to hear from Casey's defense team, including the psychologists and various experts that were hired to defend her at trial. By this point of the series, we've heard from various people who are now firmly laying the foundation that all of Casey's behavior, every single bit of it, is just trauma and nothing more. It's then that we hear from Dr. Harry Kropp, the psychologist who not only proclaims that Casey has no psychological issues whatsoever, but he explains that he administered the MMPI that proves that there is nothing wrong with Casey Anthony, and that at worst she has PTSD from the trauma stemming from her childhood. But I want to give you some insights into how the legal process actually works when it comes to hiring experts like him. Those of you that have watched the documentary may recall that Casey said that she met with four different psychologists while incarcerated. Did you notice that we didn't hear from all four of them? Well, there's a very good reason for that. When you do litigation and trial work and you're trying to locate an expert, you can't tell them what to say. But what you can do is throw as many doctors at your case as you can until one of them gives you the report that you want to bring to trial. It's not exactly doctor shopping, but it happens all the time in the legal profession. It's why at every single trial you've ever seen televised that there is always some expert from the prosecution going before the jury making claims that completely contradict the expert from the defendant. And I realize that there are a lot of legal professionals who won't like to hear this, but it's been my experience that whatever side you represent at trial, rest assured there's an expert somewhere out there who will for a fee come and testify on your behalf. Now I do want to say that there are plenty of reputable experts who don't exclusively testify for one side or the other, but open a Google search and see how many of them characterize their expertise by what side they typically testify for. It's just how the justice system works, sadly. Now, concerning this doctor's statements about Casey passing the MMPI with flying colors, the MMPI is a test that is comprised of over 400 true and false questions. And every forensic psychologist I've ever worked with has told me that using that test alone should not be the only mechanism for a clinical diagnosis. Meaning that test alone cannot completely exclude the possibility of a mental disorder. And I know this because a former inmate that I once knew took the test and passed it with flying colors. Twice. I know this because I worked with him and I saw his reports. Now, he believed that he needed lithium and other heavy-duty psych meds, but this forensic psychologist he met with didn't agree and instead gave him depression and anxiety medication. So years later, when he committed a homicide outside of his home, it goes without saying that I really felt like a true and false test might not capture all of the nuances of the human mind. And especially a human brain that is on trial for the death penalty who has a long-standing history of lying. But you know what Casey never did in any of the three episodes? She never explained how in the world she was able to describe to her cellmate the crime scene where Kaylee was found. 
because according to Casey, her father told her that Kaylee would be fine and that they would be reunited. So how in the world was she able to describe what Kaylee was found in? The Winnie the Pooh blanket or the black trash bag? Things that police never told anyone and that she couldn't have known due to the fact that she was incarcerated when she was found. And that the only person responsible for disposing Kaylee's remains could have possibly known. But I'm sure when she eventually joins the Dancing with the Stars cast, we'll finally get answers to that question. At least until then, she'll have plenty of time to think of a way to blame her father for it. Now, Towards the end of the second episode, we are told that Casey was offered a plea deal that she says she adamantly declined because she categorically refused to accept any guilt or culpability in her case. But someone else who worked on her team, her own private investigator, Dominic Casey, begs to differ. In his affidavit, he explains that Casey did want to take a plea deal and that her lawyer, Jose Baez, stopped her from doing it. And it's all of Casey's rewriting the past that bothers me so much because she's already convincing far too many people that she was somehow the victim and that she's been innocent all along. And that's what is such a travesty to me, the incredible power of a subjective visual narrative, how it magically changes even the most ardent naysayers into firm believers that the victim of this crime wasn't just Kaylee, but also the person who was nearly convicted of her death. And with each lie Casey tells, the memory of Kaylee is stained with the hands of the person who was legally responsible for protecting her. And it's for that reason that I remind everyone that Casey Anthony wasn't determined to be innocent of this crime. She was just found not guilty. And there is light years of difference between those two distinctions. I believe that Casey Anthony is just one of the many people who have gamed the judicial system and throughout the course of her life has found ways to reject the most fundamental responsibilities of a mother, of a daughter, and now of a convicted felon who is slowly convincing the world that no matter what she's done or how you feel, she's not to blame for any of it because she is desperate to get back the life that she refused to give to her own daughter, Kaylee Marie Anthony. A short time later, the defense team of Casey Anthony begins to discuss the trial. And during the very short period of time that this documentary actually covers the trial, we hear from her team all the reasons why the forensic evidence presented at trial was either unreliable or inconclusive. Now, it's very important to remember that we aren't hearing from forensic experts, but from Casey's lawyers, you know, the people who were paid to defend her from the death penalty. And it would be the equivalent of going to the foot doctor to discuss your taxes. Sure, maybe your foot doctor has some helpful insights on your taxes, but they're not the people you rely on or trust to make the final call in those situations. Point being, they are not exactly the most objective people to be analyzing forensic evidence and then speaking as though they have the requisite education required to speak as an authority on the forensics as though they have a doctorate in the field. They even make ridiculous claims that cadaver dogs are unreliable, which any prosecutor will tell you is complete nonsense, and the case law supporting the overwhelming value of cadaver dogs is beyond reproach. Now, I don't have the dozens of hours that I would love to take and disprove every single claim that they made in this ridiculous segment, but their entire narrative is aimed at convincing you that the jury got it right, that the evidence against Casey was flimsy at best. The entire last 20 minutes of the second episode is a masterclass in disinformation in a way that should be studied by the FBI and the CIA in their counterintelligence operations. Because the sheer number of people that I've seen in just the last few days since its release commenting that they have radically changed their opinions about this case is completely staggering. And someday, when I have an entire team to support me, I will go through the entire trial and explain why the evidence of Casey's guilt was and is overwhelming and that their claim of a lack of forensics was a total myth. Sadly, the prosecution did a truly horrendous job explaining it, and an exceptionally poor job of presenting it to the jury. 
And even worse, their closing arguments and their instructions to the jury should be taught in law school for how not to end a jury trial. But the failure to convict Casey Anthony does not in any way mean that she's innocent. And this is best demonstrated in the Florida DCS report that clearly states that Casey Anthony is responsible for the death of Kaylee Marie Anthony. And nothing Casey can say or do will ever change that fact. But her defense team truly does a masterful job of all but saying that maybe Casey wasn't found guilty because she was actually innocent. It is truly a masterclass. One of the more glaring inconsistencies about Casey's claims is that she says that Kaylee didn't drown accidentally in the pool. She says, and I quote, there are too many scenarios about what could have happened, but her drowning in the pool is not one of them. It's not possible. She goes on to explain that on that day, she saw that the pool ladder wasn't near or inside the pool. Instead, she heavily implies that her father intentionally did whatever he did, even though she never specifically alleges anything. And now in retrospect, it only looks like she was trying to avoid a defamation lawsuit by saying it that way. But here's the major inconsistency about that statement. Because her own lawyer in his book states that Casey was the one who claimed Kaylee drowned. So how does she explain that? She now instead claims that Jose Baez used her mother's idea of the drowning and went with it. Something lawyers are not allowed to do. So let's be clear. She's not only leveling claims of a felonious cover-up from her father. She's also claiming that her lawyer is a lying, unethical scumbag who made up her entire defense without her say-so. And did she protest this to the judge? Did she tell the judge at any point that her lawyer is lying and making up stories that aren't true? Because both Casey and Jose Baez statements cannot both be true. Either she's lying or he is. And the thing that just doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever is how a convicted liar is now given the benefit of the doubt with every word that comes out of her mouth in this documentary, despite how it contradicts her own story from trial. And apparently... People are just lapping it up as gospel truth. But by episode three, we begin to see the true motivations of Casey Anthony. She explains what it was like to go through the process of having been tried for murder and that it was hell for her, clearly attempting to express the pain and agony she went through during this time. And you know, I can't help but think, what about Kaylee? I can't imagine what she went through. And shouldn't that be at the forefront of this series? Nope. Instead, we get Casey telling us that she wouldn't wish the experience of being on trial on her worst enemy because we can't imagine the suffering she endured. But you know what I can't imagine? The suffering that Kaylee endured. And no matter which story you choose to believe in, either way, Casey should have stopped it. She should have called law enforcement and trauma is not an excuse for failing your child in a moment where life and death is on the line. Throughout the beginning of episode three, we are reintroduced to Clint House and Cameron Capanna, both former roommates of Tony Lazaro. Initially, they are vocally against Casey, and they seem to represent the American public at large, angry, hostile, firm in their belief of Casey's guilt, because by the end of this episode, the creators of this documentary will use carefully placed information to manipulate the viewer into changing their mind about what they think they know. And now after having seen it, I can't help but wonder why the leadership at NBC greenlit this documentary because it calls into question the entirety of their credibility as a journalistic organization. And this is the very antithesis of what the media was created to do. A short time later, Casey begins to watch clips of her parents, George and Cindy, conducting the various interviews that they've done over the years. With disdain emblazoned across her face, she proclaims with disgust how they only did those interviews for money, which is not only hysterical coming from her, but is the definition of hypocrisy coming from someone who shopped her story for three quarters of a million dollars mere months after her acquittal in 2011. But then, against a swelling backdrop of emotional piano medley intended to pull on her heartstrings, Casey begins to cry and says, and I quote, I want to know why. I want to know why she was taken out of my arms. Why didn't he call 911? I wasn't the only one who was home. Why keep blaming me for something I didn't do? Casey, why didn't you call 911? You were Kaylee's mother, 
and you were just as capable of protecting your own child. And you're the only person who had the primary legal duty to protect Kaylee. And now you think by blaming your father, you can somehow erase the entirety of what you've done? Now, for the record, I don't believe her story about her father ending the life of Kaylee. But even if it's true, let's follow it to its logical destination. Because this is what Casey Anthony expects all of us to believe. That she held her baby, the baby that she loved with all of her heart, cold, unresponsive, and lifeless, and instead of calling 911, chose to believe a man that had harmed her for her entire life. And regardless of how we feel about that, the law says that she had an obligation to protect Kaylee, to call 911, to report her father. And speaking of that, she correctly pointed out that she could still file charges against her father for the trauma he caused. So now that it's out in the open, I want to publicly call for Casey Anthony to go to the police and file a report against George Anthony. Because if any of what she said in this documentary is true, then a man who committed a homicide against a child has been on the loose since 2008. And now that she's told us about all of his crimes, I can't help but wonder, where's the police report? And do you know why this is such a big deal? Because George Anthony has other grandchildren. If Casey's story is true, then she's allowing a serial child abuser to continue to be around other children and doing nothing to stop it. Casey Anthony called the police when a woman threw a drink in her face in a bar. So why hasn't she called the police to file a report against her own father? Because wouldn't that be the right thing to do since apparently she claims he masterminded the crimes against Kaylee? You know, it's almost like if her story about what she says he did to Kaylee was actually true, then once again, Casey is failing to do the right thing and contact the police. I mean, unless of course it's just another lie, and she knows that reporting it will only expose that lie, but what do I know? I, I guess we just need to take the word of a convicted liar that this time, she's finally telling the truth. One of the most ridiculous parts of this entire series is when they discuss George Anthony's testimony at the grand jury and during Casey's trial. Casey and her entire defense team come out and say that George Anthony was trying to put Casey on death row. This is one of the most unbelievably ridiculous segments of any documentary I have seen in the entirety of my life. And let me clue you into why from a legal perspective. When a grand jury is impaneled and the various parties related to the case are identified, the court will issue subpoenas to the people who need to testify. Subpoenas are not an invitation that you can just choose to ignore. In fact, if you are subpoenaed and don't show up, you can be held in contempt of court, a bench warrant can be issued, and then you can be thrown in jail. George Anthony did not have anything whatsoever to do with deciding which charges were filed against his daughter. That's the job of the county attorney and the prosecutor's office. If George Anthony had refused to testify, they could have thrown him in jail and compelled him to do so. Furthermore, even if he had publicly stated that he did not believe that his daughter was in any way involved and petitioned the prosecution to drop the charges, it would not have had any bearing on what happened in her case in the slightest. The prosecutor does not consult the family of the offender on how to proceed with charges. That's not how any of this works. And when you view this case from the perspective of a man who was himself a police detective for 10 years, who smelled decomposition in Casey's car and slowly came to the realization that she was likely involved in Kaylee's death, then you see that his choice to testify was not only brave, but I imagine it was the hardest thing that he ever did in his entire life. I don't believe that George Anthony wanted to testify against her, but Casey forced him to. And now, all these years later, she's punishing him for it. And before I'm done with this video, I will show you the documented history that outlines Casey Anthony's vindictiveness against anyone who dares to cross her. One of the more common hallmarks of Cluster B personality types that I've come across over the years of my career is their exceptional ability at gaslighting. Casey uses her entire defense team to lay down the foundation that George had been supporting Casey to her face and on the media, but then was proclaiming her guilt to law enforcement. The implication being that he was trying to publicly support his daughter while throwing her under the bus for a crime that he actually committed. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this is Gaslighting 101. In every moment that we see George Anthony in this documentary, he is framed as this sickening monster who lied to and manipulated everyone around him. And yet this documentary seems to ignore the fact that George Anthony wasn't put on trial. The smell of decomposition wasn't found in his car. His DNA wasn't found at the scene of where Kaylee was found. And if Casey is so concerned about putting this crime on his shoulders, then why wouldn't she subpoena his cell records herself? She doesn't need to be law enforcement to do that. Why wouldn't she have gone to law enforcement immediately after her trial and told them the truth about her monstrous father? It's not like she had a relationship with him anymore. Didn't she want to protect other children from him? And in my experience, that's what you do with people like Casey Anthony, professional gaslighters. You force them down the road that they put you on until you arrive at a place where they can no longer continue their ruse. Because if any of what Casey Anthony said about her father and the crime she's alleging he committed against her daughter is true, then in the interest of protecting the public, I have just one question. Where's the police report? Shortly after this, Casey and her defense team begin to directly imply that the police completely dropped the ball by failing to fully vet George Anthony. And while I do believe that they should have done a better job of getting all the records for everyone involved in this case, they were never told this story by Casey. No one ever heard her story about her evil father until the trial, and now this new version from Casey in just the last few days. So it's very easy to go back in time and point the finger at law enforcement and claim they did a shoddy job, when Casey is the only one who withheld these claims until 14 years later. And for the producers and the network of this series to watch this and not even bother to think about the implications of how all these claims would land, that there is no proof for any of it, and not even bother to provide one scintilla of evidence that supports any of Casey's outrageous claims. Simply put, if I was NBC Legal, I'd be real worried about getting pulled into a defamation lawsuit right about now. Especially when you consider that all we have are the stories that she made after her arrest. There is no evidence provided in the nearly four hours of this documentary. It's all just conjecture from completely subjective parties and the word of a convicted liar. And the media wonders why so many people no longer trust them. Because they platformed a convicted felon whose crimes were that she chronically lied. And then you presented her story as factual and then gaslit the audience while shaming us into feeling sorry for her. Again, try to imagine how people would react if O.J. Simpson went on television for nearly four hours, blamed Cato Kalin for absolutely everything, no evidence, just accusations. I'm sure the general public would absolutely love that. And I can't wait to see that series on Peacock, Spring 2023. But the part of this documentary that I have had to watch and walk away from at least half a dozen times is when director Alexandra Dean becomes the disembodied voice of Casey Anthony, telling Cameron Capanna and Clint House that the reason why Casey had been lying all her life was actually because of the trauma stemming from her father. As the director begins to tell the new narrative of Casey's story, why she did what she did and reframes everything they thought they knew, we watch as these two men radically change their opinions right before our eyes. And I couldn't help but think of Alexandra Dean's comments about this documentary before it even aired. She said, As a filmmaker and a journalist, my interest was in getting closer to the unbiased truth by hearing all sides of the story from opposing voices to Casey herself. I believe the result will surprise many and cause the American public to look at this story in a new light. And if this is where we have landed in our day and age on what we describe as journalism, then it's no wonder why so many people believe that journalism is dead. But further evidence of just how biased this documentary clearly is was best demonstrated when they begin to discuss the searches conducted at 2.51 p.m. on the day that Kaylee went missing. For the first time, Casey is confronted with the damning search of foolproof suffocation, and this is what she says. While making a face that reminds me of a child who just got caught with their hand in a cookie jar, she says, it wasn't me. I can tell you that. Everyone had each other's passwords. 
Well, that's weird, Casey. So then why in the world did your mom and dad ask you for your MySpace password when you were in jail? That doesn't really make any sense. And if you ever watch this series for yourself, you'll likely notice that no one ever challenges Casey's statements. She's allowed to say whatever she wants, unchecked. Because the thing is, if you believe what Casey says about this search, then you will also have to believe that her father logged into her AOL Messenger, conducted those searches, and then immediately logged into her MySpace account, an account that he didn't have the password for, then got into his car and somehow made it to work in eight minutes, oh, and then called Casey as soon as he arrived. And never mind the fact that when she's saying all of this, if you just watch her talk, it's like watching a class in how to detect when someone's lying. And I'm not even remotely a qualified body language expert. But you know what? I have to admit, I was wrong. This is exceptional journalism. Because the more Casey talks, the more lies I'm able to catch her in. So well done, Alexandra. Well done. One of the most controversial segments of Casey's series is when she begins to watch Kaylee's funeral. Now, I've seen the entire segment of George Anthony speaking at her funeral, and I would recommend that you do the same and not base your opinions solely on the words of a documentary seemingly telling you what to think. But I do want to say clearly that we don't know what George did or did not do. But I do want to speak as a father of three beautiful girls, as a survivor of childhood trauma, and as a man. Becoming a father was and is the highlight of my life. Both of my eldest girls grew up with severe childhood asthma. My eldest was even hospitalized because of RSV as a toddler. That same week, I contracted pneumonia and was unable to see her for large portions of the time that she was hospitalized. Eventually, I was cleared and was allowed to come see her. Nothing to that point of my life has ever brought me more heartache than the moment I walked in and saw my child in a hospital gurney. Seeing her tiny frame sitting in that massive hospital bed, not saying a word, not smiling, and looking more sick than I had ever seen her before. Normally, she spoke all the time, laughed, played, and always maintained such a beautiful countenance. Hearing the laughs of my children brought me joy that I still can't fully explain with words, which was why seeing her there, suffering that way, was almost more than I could bear. And it's why I have always supported organizations like St. Jude, because children are the legacy we leave behind, and we owe it to them to give them the best chance at a good life. I will never forget holding her for the first time shortly after she was released. I could have held her forever, especially because she was still so sick and all I wanted to do was take it away. I remember trying to put her in her car seat, but she refused and held on to me, not wanting me to let go. I will never forget that moment for as long as I live. But the words I just spoke, they don't come easily for some men. And that doesn't make me special, but sadly in our society, men are both taught and conditioned to keep our emotions at bay. It's why some men are so bad at expressing their emotions, especially with words, because it's not something that was widely encouraged for many of us throughout our entire lives. And for as long as I can remember, I was conditioned that physical affection and emotion from a father was unnecessary distasteful, and even inappropriate, that a father's job is to remain stoic, to provide for his family, and nothing more. But now, having watched the entire segment, I couldn't help but think about this series in the simplest possible way. Casey Anthony expects us to believe that after holding her cold and unresponsive child, that she went off with her boyfriend mere hours later, acting like she didn't have a care in the world, went to bars, went to work, stole money from friends, and then got arrested for a crime that her father committed. And really think about this for a second. Casey Anthony is telling us that she went to jail and risked life in prison, as well as the death penalty, to protect a man who is still around children to this day for crimes that she has still yet to report to any law enforcement agency on the face of the earth. Oh, and one more thing. Her father, who was a homicide detective for 10 years, committed these crimes and just dumped Kaylee in a swamp down the street from his house. 
didn't bother to bury her, and then used items from his house that could easily be tracked back to him. And never mind the fact that she was able to describe those items found at the crime scene, despite claiming to not know what actually happened to Kaylee. That's what she expects us to believe. But I'll hand it to her, she is, in my opinion, one of the most proficient and talented pathological liars I have ever seen in my life. And the evidence of that fact is that a major network greenlit the words of a convicted liar and is now passing it off as fact. And anyone who dares to disagree is just a closed-minded idiot who doesn't understand childhood trauma. What a time to be alive, and what a disservice to the memory of Kaylee Marie Anthony. Now, in closing, I want to share with you one of the most compelling pieces of the puzzle in the Casey Anthony story. What I'm about to show you will fully explain why I find her claims to be suspicious at best and diabolical at worst. Because someone very close to Casey Anthony predicted the claims that she would make in this very documentary well over six years ago. Someone who has largely been dismissed and ignored until now. In a previous episode, I discussed the affidavit of Dominic Casey, but I didn't yet know how important that document would become. In January of 2016, Dominic issued an affidavit in connection to the bankruptcy proceeding of Casey Anthony. And it's very important that you understand who he is and why his affidavit is so critically important at this moment in time. Dominic Casey is a personal investigator who was hired by the Baez law firm on behalf of Casey Anthony. He is not someone who worked with the prosecution. Instead, he is someone who worked for the Anthony family and was given direct access to Casey during the most important moments of her case. It could be argued that he has given us more insight into that time frame than anyone else has since the trial. So why is he so important right now? Allow me to show you. In this initial seven-page affidavit, Dominic provides us with his sworn statement before the court. And in it, he explains that he was hired by the Baez law firm on behalf of Casey Anthony in July of 2008, shortly after Casey's arrest. He reveals that attorney Baez had told him that Casey had admitted that she was responsible for Kaylee's death and that she was the one who had disposed of Kaylee's remains. The affidavit goes on to explain that while Kaylee was still missing, former high school friends of Casey Anthony had contacted the sheriff's department to inform them of a critical new lead. They explained that during their high school years that they had shared a teenage hangout with Casey Anthony located off of Suburban Drive, and they encouraged law enforcement to look in that area, the same area where Kaylee Anthony's remains would be found. But hold on because the best part's coming. Dominic's affidavit explains that prior to the grand jury indictment on October 14, 2008, that Casey had met with him to thank him for helping her team. She then explained to him that she wasn't sure of all the details of her defense yet, other than that her father would be implicated in the crime. And her reason for that? Because he was the only one in the family who would be testifying against her at the grand jury. Allow me to explain why that is such a big deal. This affidavit is telling us that Casey Anthony didn't accuse her father of committing this crime because he actually did it, but rather because he was willing to testify against her. Again, not because it was the truth, but because she wanted vengeance. Because she had a vendetta. And I want to remind you that the person saying this is someone who worked for Casey Anthony, Someone who was hired and paid for by her attorney. But strap in because it's about to get much worse. Dominic's affidavit goes on to explain that Casey Anthony had suggested to him that they blame her mother, Cindy, for Kaylee's drowning. Or they could blame the meter reader, Roy Cronk, for Kaylee's demise. Telling Dominic, quote, maybe we could say he kidnapped Kaylee. Dominic, of course, adamantly refuses to participate in fabricating a story involving entirely innocent parties, but allow me to read from his sworn statement of one of the most revealing sections of this court pleading. I told her vehemently then, I would not do that because we both knew that Cindy and Roy Cronk had nothing to do with Kaylee's disappearance. She was insistent 
that George, Cindy, Lee Anthony, and the meter reader be implicated and blamed for the death of Kaylee. And at the end of his affidavit, he says, I personally heard from Casey Anthony, her authorize and permit her attorneys, including Jose Baez, to make false statements about George, Cindy, Lee Anthony, Roy Cronk, and portray them as being responsible for the murder of Kaylee Marie Anthony. Sitting there reading that after watching Casey's documentary, I asked myself, what's more likely, that someone who has a documented history of lying, manipulating, misleading, and fabricating outlandish stories, someone who was convicted for lying, is now rehabilitated in telling the truth about absolutely everything, or is this affidavit a verification of what I already know about Casey Anthony? I'm going to let you make that call because this next and final segment of Dominic Casey's affidavit was presented to the court over six years ago concerning his dealings with Casey Anthony from 2008. And you tell me in the comments what you think. On page two of Dominic's affidavit, he states that on August 8, 2008, he spoke with attorney Baez concerning information he had received from Casey in their prior meeting. He says, and I quote, I presented evidence to Baez suggesting there could have been an accident and Kaylee drowned in the backyard pool. The accident snowballed out of control. Casey panicked and dumped Kaylee's body. Casey did not call for help because she was afraid to say anything. She then went on the run. She may allege that her father and brother had been molesting her since she was eight years old. And because of this, Casey was used to hiding her pain. In Casey Anthony's documentary, she claims that every time she lied, that there were kernels of truth wrapped up in her lies. But I can't help but wonder how a document that was written six years ago could so accurately describe claims that Casey would make and that we are hearing for the first time in 2022. Now in closing today, I want to remind everyone why this case still matters. Kaylee Marie Anthony would have been a 17-year-old teenage girl this year. She would be the same age as one of my daughters. And knowing that is truly heartbreaking when you consider the effort her mother has put into obscuring the truth of what really happened. But I want to remind everyone that while we can't bring justice to this case in a way that would satisfy the hurt and anger that has been caused, we can remember this beautiful child that touched the hearts of the American people and the world. She will live on in our memory, and I will continue to advocate for the truth in this case, because if anyone deserved justice, it was her. Now, if you enjoyed today's content, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing. Those seemingly small things go such a long way in helping this new channel continue to grow and reach more people. And in advance, allow me to thank you for taking a moment out of your day to be here with me today. I also want to take a moment to thank our incredible Patreon and YouTube supporters. Over the last few weeks, our support on both Patreon and YouTube has grown in a way that is both humbling and exciting. Thank you all for supporting the BCM community in a way that helps ensure the future of this channel for years to come. Also, I'm going to be doing a celebratory giveaway for anyone subscribed to the channel as a thank you to all of you for helping me blow past 20,000 subscribers. So keep an eye out for my community post, which will have details on how to enter the giveaway. It's just my way of showing all of you how grateful I am for this platform and for the support you've shown me. Now, finally, a new series will be premiering next week on the channel and it will include my own personal story of having left a cult that I was raised in from my childhood. It's going to be an episode that you won't want to miss. Again, thank you for being here today and for sharing your time with me. It's a privilege that I cherish and that I am truly grateful for. This has been Behind Criminal Minds. We'll see you next time.